I'll let you know when it's ready. Okay, oh heck, yeah, all right, it is ready. We are live. We already have our two of our MVP, three of our MVPs, uh, Royal Roy, Howard Care, and Anya Volotion. What's up? So tonight is going to be a super special stream. Uh, this is our first uh, interview stream. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, just leave a comment in the chat. I think, I think you probably can, but it's our first uh, interview stream with uh, Dr. Connor McDonnell, um, a seagrass ecologist uh, based in Florida. And uh, like, yeah, <laughs> Connor, we got some good comments already. Like people, people are excited. So this is super cool. Um, so a couple, a couple things, guys. Um, and, oh, we got some likes. We got some likes. This is great. So, <laughs> um, so a couple things, guys, uh, just so I can hear Connor clearly or like we can all hear Connor clearly. Uh, I probably won't have some music tonight. So um, and it'll be just kind of more like a podcast. Uh, format, um, and we're going to be talking about the nurse shark, Ginglimastoma serratum, an awesome, uh, very charismatic Atlantic species and Florida species, um, and one that really likes seagrass. So, um, another like! Oh man, P we're, people are pumped. So, <laughs> um, and then I think I have one more. Th oh, one more thing. So, um, we're uh, please ask any questions at any time, um, and since uh, Connor and I will be engaging with each other, um, I, I may not be able to see all of the questions, so uh, apologies in advance if I can't get to all of the questions, but feel free to ask either one of us anything at any time. So I think uh, with that, we're kind of ready to go. So Connor, hello, welcome to our study party. So. <laughs> um and <laughs> what's well, really it's like old time yeah <laughs> so yeah connor and i uh went to school together at the uh, college of william and mary we were undergraduate biology students so this is how uh, we met we were both passionate about marine science so connor tell us a little bit of what you do now and uh kind of like where your interest in research is and uh take it away yeah uh well so um uh, after I graduated from William and Mary, um, I wanted to work in the tropics, so I got into mangrove stuff. But uh, mangroves were a little crazy to work in. It's a really difficult environment. It's one of the most hostile environments on the planet. Uh, mosquitoes, mud, uh, oysters are super sharp. Mm. So um, throughout my life, I'd wanted to work in more blue water environments, and uh, the the field of Coral science is pretty saturated at this point, but uh, seagrasses are also an extremely important ecosystem, and they've been understudied for decades. So it's an ecosystem that I really wanted to get involved in, and it's an ecosystem that I've seen in the past. Um, so actually, I think it was our junior year, um, I actually was able to visit the quote-unquote largest seagrass restoration project on the planet, or at least the largest successful project. Um, which works with uh, Zostra marina or eelgrass. So that's in the uh, Chesapeake Bay region. And I was able to volunteer and help. Uh, I believe it was with uh, seed collection at the time. So they have a big uh, seed collection facility and nursery at uh, the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. And uh, basically that helped inspire me to get into seagrass restoration in Florida, which is uh, more of a balmy climate uh, I'm, I'm from Virginia myself, but I'm not a, a, a huge fan of the cold, as many of the people close to me will uh, know and, uh, and appreciate. <laughs> so I moved down to Florida, um, and I'm currently working with the University of Florida and Florida Oceanographic Society, and I'm working on innovating seagrass restoration. So for a bit of background, uh, seagrass restoration, well, seagrasses in general, have been an ecosystem that has been in decline for decades. And currently, I believe the decline is about 7% per year. Uh, it used to be a tenth of that uh, before 1990. And uh, basically, the methods to restore seagrasses and our understanding of the environments that we restore seagrasses in are relatively limited. So seagrass restoration is really difficult. And uh, as a matter of fact, there are studies that have proven that seagrass restoration is harder or has a lower success rate than coral restoration. Oh. So my job is to help determine different techniques to innovate seagrass restoration, make it cheaper, and uh, make it more successful. And what that will do is it will help 
get more mileage out of the seagrass that we have in our nurseries. And it'll also incentivize uh, government and nonprofit organizations to get more involved with seagrass restoration. So that's where I'm at right now. Dude, that that's awesome. Oh my gosh. And like, I didn't, I didn't know that about, um, and like, actually like, like two, two questions. I'm so sorry. Like, like, uh, so, so one, um, uh, <laughs> for, uh, for your, I, I, I think, um, uh, we can hear you, but like, I think the mic settings are just a little bit quiet. Um, if you're able to turn it up on your mic, um, mm-hmm. and then two, um, while you're doing that, I'm like, I had no idea that seagrass was more difficult than coral as far as, uh, like just, just restoring that kind of habitat. Why, why is seagrass uh, more difficult than coral in, in terms of like bringing that habitat back? Um, so I will admit that I'm not super competent with my mic. There's only a setting to reduce the decibels. Okay. So I'm just going to sort of keep the mic. And just That's fine. Let me know if it's too low from there. That's cool. <laughs> um, but uh, to answer, to answer your, your question regarding the seagrass, um, so uh, seagrass restoration can be more difficult, partially because um, of water quality issues, of environmental disturbances to the seagrasses, which includes uh, herbivory. And we also don't have good methods to combat the different environmental disturbances. For example, with herbivory, we can try building a fence or uh, a cage. Uh, Cages are often used to keep uh, manatees and sea turtles off the seagrass long enough for the seagrass to establish themselves. Um, The issue becomes, though, that unless if the, the cages routinely monitored and scrubbed, algae and epiphytes can grow on the cage and it can reduce the amount of light. Um, Seagrasses are also very sensitive to transplantation shock. So uh, as a result, they can die or they can be more vulnerable to other environmental disturbances like wave action or herbivory that can finish it off. Mm. So um, I I think that those are sort of the, the main reasons that seagrass restoration has traditionally been harder than coral restoration. Not to say that coral restoration is easy in any sense. It's an ecosystem that's in severe decline, and it's not exactly an optimistic outlook given ocean acidification and climate change. Mm-hmm. It's just the, the statistics show that uh, seagrass restoration projects have been less successful in the past. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um and like I, I know, like in in your research, um, you do come across a lot of sharks, uh, or or like because like a lot of sharks use like sea, seagrass habitat, um, and like especially our shark, uh, the nurse shark for uh, tonight. So um, before we dive into that more, uh, I mentioned um, that uh, a lot of uh, um, members of our of our Dr. Jaws group love fossils, and you too are a avid fossil collector. Um, so, and I think, do you have, I, I, I may be wrong, but do you have fossils with you right now? That, <laughs> you're, you're acting as if I didn't run into you back yeah. two minutes before. Yeah. But yes, I, I do in fact have some, a couple fossils that I literally have in my backpack at all times to show people. Uh, I'm sort of embarrassed to admit that, but it's because fossils are like literally that cool. Mm-hmm. So um the the first one which you guys will appreciate the most is a uh not exactly sure what species it is i'll be completely honest but um yeah i want to say it's like mako or great white i don't think it's a meg i mean it it might be a meg that that actually wait can you uh um hold it closer to your to your yeah perfect I don't know, guys. What do you think? Because, like, I see a burlet. It is a Meg. Royal Roy Rory says it's a Meg. So, that's it. You got it. You got a Megalodon. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's... Yeah, holy hell. That's aw- That's great. Yeah, because, like, um... One thing, and I and we, we actually... I, I, I didn't know this before uh, we did the stream. Like, um... It's got this, um... Burlet. It's this, it's this area between the root and the uh, animal. So it's like, I, I, I it's hard to describe, but... Um, and, um, and, uh, um, we're, we're, we're now in the so, so, um, oh, wait, it's yeah, so, so, yeah, 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 yeah that's, 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 that's a little thing, so that's, 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 that's pretty awesome, awesome, though. So. <laughs> nice. Well, 
I got a uh, a chunk of mammoth ivory for good measure as well. It's completely fossilized, but a friend of mine uh, found actually a complete mammoth tusk. We were in the Santa Fe River together, and he found the tip. And I, I like I could not believe that it was a mammoth tusk. So I was like, oh, it's just a log. Like you know, put it back. And he's like, oh, there's more. And it was ridiculous. But this is a piece of fossilized uh, mammoth tusk. Wow. Um, this was found in the like the public part of the Itchtuckney River. Um, so it's downstream. If you guys are familiar with it, uh, it's downstream from the state park, which is one of the best state parks in the entire state of Florida. Um, incredible clear water um, and a, a lot of really interesting interactions with um, different wildlife. You can you can almost touch the long nosed gar that live in that ecosystem. Mm-hmm. You almost always see them. Um, there's a chance to see manatees this time Ooh. of year. Um, there's even a chance to see otters and gators. Uh, and I even got harassed by a, uh, a water snake, oh. which I deserved because I was trying to film it. And then it turned around and it was like, oh, what's that warm body over there? I want to go investigate it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, mistakes were made, but you know that's just that's just how things work Spe- um, when you're out in the wild. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of snakes, so like uh, Florida is like the cottonmouth capital, right? And then like I I lived there for a year and I I never saw one, which is like like I know people don't want to see cottonmouths, but I like I I like I personally like really like vipers. Uh, have you seen a, you've seen a cottonmouth probably, right? Or have you seen a couple? I probably. I mean, I know what they look like. Um... And I think I stepped on one <laughs> in my accident yikes. when I was fossil hunting. Holy yeah. shit. So, so I was um, in its prime habitat. I was actually scouting out places on the Peace River to go fossil hunting. And uh, there was a fisherman who was up in, uh, I'm not going to remember the name of it. It was like, it, it was like one of the northernmost towns in the Peace mm. River. And I, like I like to chat it up with people. I like to learn more about the ecosystems um, uh, that I'm like investigating, <laughs> either for science or fun. And uh, you know, we're chatting it up, and I just kind of casually back up, and I something like under me felt like it was there was a seatbelt getting ripped from under Yikes. my foot. And uh, thankfully, I wasn't bitten or anything because I would have been, you know, I wasn't wearing like proper boots or anything. I was, if I was lucky, I was wearing like my dive booties. Um, but yeah, it was, it was something big. Um, but you know, it didn't want anything to do with me and, and I was lucky that it didn't participate in any sort of self-defense, but yeah. Um, oh man. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny, a couple different things. Um, cotton mouths are known for, uh, resting on the, uh, cypress knees oh. in, in swamps. Hmm. So of the cypress trees which basically act as the cypress trees like snorkel. Uh, it's a way to get oxygen. But they rest on those cypress knees, and they're like about like waist level. So it's... <laughs> I, I don't really want to think about the, the different possibilities associated with uh, in dangerous encounters with the cottonmouth there. But they also float. So there are videos of cottonmouths just drifting downstream like an angry, hissy log. <laughs> um which is also just there are a few videos online of that which which I find very entertaining but also also terrified because I, I just imagine just snorkeling and then just like running straight into this like venomous because cotton mouths you know they, they have a reputation whether or not it's earned I'm not you know I'm not qualified to say but I certainly wouldn't want to find out the mm. hard way you know I might have been very lucky that one time I don't know so, yeah they um yeah um and also, Roy Roy made a great comment and snorkel noodles. So, uh, cotton mouths is snorkel noodles. <laughs> but, because <laughs> um, I know, um, like, uh, we have three vipers in Virginia. Um, like, we're up here in Virginia. Like, copperhead is not that poisonous. Cotton mouth is very poisonous. Uh, timber owl snake is very poisonous. I'm pretty sure you need medical treatment if you, if you get bit by a cotton mouth. Copperhead, you can kind of tough it out. 
but a cotton mouth or a a really? yeah apparently like i've had i had a um an acquaintance who she was in her 60s and she got bit by a copperhead and she was like oh, i'll tough it out and she did and it's like it's just the dose is very low wow. i think the dose of um and i'm sure herpetologist will gladly correct me if i'm wrong in the chat uh, or in the comments <laughs> but like um but the dose of a copperhead is like maybe a third of a cotton mouth uh, and a third of a timber rattlesnake, but timber rattlesnakes and cottonmouths they have like equal dosage. But anyway, uh, <laughs> we should probably, if it sounds cool, let's, let's we should switch over to the 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 biggest snake of all of them, nurse shark. <laughs> Smooth transition. Um, uh, so so what's fun is like Connor and I set up uh, tabs on Connor's end, so Connor has full control. Which I, th I think that works out the best with kind of like our, our jerry-rigged system. Um, so um, I think, uh, I think if, whenever you get a chance to share your screen, um, you have first pick on what we do and kind of what we explore on Ginglimastoma serratum, the nurse shark. And actually, uh, I guess kind of the first question is like, have you, seen, have you seen nurse sharks? You've seen nurse sharks in the wild, I think, right? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're the, I think... Like, the way I like to see them is they're the perfect beginner <laughs> because they they possess so many of the qualities that, like, wows people. And, you know, like, they're large. They're, like, gorgeous animals. Um, so they possess a lot of the megafauna, like, you know, people fall in love with them. But they're also, relatively speaking, uh harmless compared to some of the other mm -hmm. sharks now there are certainly multiple cases where nurse sharks have bitten people um but it certainly pales in comparison and severity to what other sharks mm -hmm. can do and not to say that sharks are extremely dangerous animals in general but um i'd certainly rather be in the water with a hundred nurse sharks than one bull shark. same <laughs> so, i i love yeah yeah like i respect bull sharks and i i someday hope to see one um in the water but um you know nurse sharks you know i see the tail and almost immediately like you know it, like there's no concern because i'm not go looking to harass the mm -hmm. animal you know i'm not looking to catch it or do anything to it i'm just existing in the environment with it so usually they like to hang out around uh large like uh rocky reefs <laughs> is usually where you'll see them just not moving around. Hmm. But um, they do often feed on a lot of the organisms that grow on seagrass beds. Um, so uh, that is a, a significant connection to nurse sharks. They don't eat seagrass like bonnet heads allegedly <laughs> do, but they do depend on a lot of the organisms that, at least in large part, uh, are dependent on seagrass. Yeah, well... So let me go... I'll pick... Oh, oh no, yeah. I'm sorry. I was just curious. What do they? Um, because they, they like whelks and things. I think right as a primary prey item. Am I right on that? Or like, what are some of their prey items? Uh, well, I'm. Well, uh, at least according to the National Geographic <laughs> article I read yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I knew that they fed on crustaceans. Like that's the main mm -hmm. thing. But they also do feed on fish apparently. Mm. So, um, yeah, I do find that rather fascinating because it doesn't appear that they're. Like their mouths don't appear to be adapted to catching fish per se. They seem they have the crushing jaws that are meant for just as you're saying, like invertebrates. Mm -hmm. so. What's really cool um, uh, about these uh, or this species, and I, I, just nurse sharks in general, is um, so like they're they're famous like buccal pumpers, like they sit on the seabed and actively pump water over the gills. But they use the same adaptation to like basically be a vacuum for prey items like like in different habitats like they'll be if something's wedged in a rock crevice they'll just like just like like I don't know like exactly like the the numbers on like how powerful that force is but it's like it's like the most powerful vacuum in the world <laughs> like ripping something out of its hiding place so they're it's a really cool method of feeding but <laughs> it's incredible. Mm -hmm. One thing that I learned recently uh, that really interested me is that the the name nurse shark is derived from an old English name, which means um, like bottom dwelling shark, or like so. I thought that was oh pretty fascinating. That that is because like I thought yeah I thought um so a common 
That is wild, because it's like, and that that makes more sense, because like the common um, adage is like it's the uh, the barbels, like like people mistook them for like nursing. You know, so like that, that's like the mm. common thing that's yes. like constantly recirculated and stuff. So the fact that it's based on like an old English name, meaning bottom dweller, I like that more. That makes more sense. <laughs> like, Yeah. Let me see. This was the National Geographic article that I quote unquote. Cycle. Cool. cool. Um, let me see. Entomology. Yes. Old English word for seafloor shark Love. is the most likely theory. However, the other, the theory that you just mentioned is also one of the one of the theories listed yeah. i think um yeah wait what do you think yeah i think i think the seafloor thing makes more sense and like just just legends have just grown and the nerd yeah it's just like because i'm like i'm like i'm like what maniac <laughs> thinks that this, like the sharks nurse off off the barbels so yeah i like i like that i had no idea about that old english uh i like that more <laughs> Yeah, I agree. <laughs> now, one thing I don't understand is that people actually fish and catch nurse sharks. And really? Um, I, I yeah, there was a video recently done by a land shark. Now, uh, which is like a, a Facebook and YouTube channel um, where they caught and flayed a nurse no. shark. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a fisherman myself, but. I don't know. It, it, there's just something that feels wrong. I guess I guess it's because it's a shark mostly, mm -hmm. and they have lower reproductive rates than a lot of the popular sport species. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, maybe that was part of the point <laughs> for social media. You know, uh, get more clicks if you see a shark getting butchered. You know, oh, it was legal. But, mm. you know. Yeah. No, I yeah. I feel you on the greatest. Thing. Yeah. It's interesting uh, you bring up like the uh, the low reproductive rate because uh, I think when we were uh, kind of prepping today we were looking at a, a couple different there, there seems to be a discrepancy on like the conservation status like because um, I'm even seeing just is this Florida Museum of Natural History yeah because I'm seeing I, I just saw a glance yeah. at it Florida Museum said data deficient I think National Geographic said uh, not listed or something data oh data deficient yeah they're they're all. Set. And then the yeah. latest IUCN red list is vulnerable, I think, is, is like the current listing. So, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you're right. So, that's interesting. The uh, population the trend, trend is decreasing. Yeah. yeah. Man. But I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, to, to like, uh, we, we can go back to. Um, sorry, you, you have control. Oh, no, certainly. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, you know, I think it's. It's relevant to point out, too, that the, the shark's range is not just in the U.S., so we probably, relatively speaking, manage our sharks mm -hmm. well, but it's in a lot of other areas where there might be more population growth or less regulation where the sharks might be declining at a more rapid rate. Yeah. So, uh, especially if you go to a place like the Keys, you know, you'll, you, you couldn't imagine the nurse shark being... A vulnerable or endangered species you see them on like every dive <laughs> um it's similar to um the queen conch in the caribbean the queen conch is like just declining precipitously whereas in florida uh i remember going to a state park bondazel state park and just seeing dozens of them on the seafloor it was hmm. insane um yeah cool hmm. uh let's see this is the I've been using um, like Florida Museum of Natural History is like pretty handy as like a quick go to for um, like shark uh, like like if you want a, a, a quick like almost like I hate the phrase quick and dirty it sounds so wrong but like a quick and dirty like breakdown of of a shark um, you know that's a good website have you ever have you ever like been to Florida Museum of Natural History since you live in Florida or like have you ever interacted with them in your research or just out of curiosity. Oh, yeah. oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, the Florida Museum of History. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I've been there many, many times. I've actually studied there for my... Uh, I, I, like, was working on my thesis in the museum. Uh, I think it was by the Native American exhibit, uh, which, is one, which is my favorite exhibit there. You know, I love the fossils, but the way they depict the Native American history is... 
it really is like mind blowing and it's very immersive. Um, and I just sort of blend in the background <laughs> and take a seat, whip open my laptop and get to work. Um, but, uh, so actually, uh, a member of the Florida museum, uh, Dr. Hulbert, uh, is responsible for the, uh, fossil permits in Florida. Oh. So, uh, for several years, actually, when, if, if you want to collect anything that's not shark's teeth or, uh, invertebrate fossils, like if you want to collect, uh, mammal fossils, you need a permit. Mm. And, um, basically it requires his, his, his signature and, and five, it was $5 in the past. And uh, instead of like submitting it through the mail, I just go directly to his, basically to his office and just get him to sign it. And usually I'd have like a couple fossils. I'd ask him to ID as well. And uh, it's really amazing seeing someone who can just look at a fossil for like a fraction (laughs) of a second and know what it is. Um, So uh, learned, learned a lot through him. And actually my, my friend uh, Joshua Gibson um, I feel like he's almost like become sort of like Dr. Hulbert in a sense, like he got his own fossil book and and now it's the same thing. It's like, I, I could show him something and he would know almost immediately what it Mm -hmm. was. So, um, yeah, it's the Florida museum is incredible. Uh, I think that, you know, in terms of museums that I've been to in my entire life, I think only the Florida museum of natural history really beats it out. Uh, and maybe the New York. Museum, oh, I love that museum. Uh, the, whichever one's in. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty mm-hmm. nice. But like this one is, it's small, but it's like it it packs like so much into it. It has an incredible butterfly garden. It has like an entire timeline of fossils in Florida, and also just in general, like like life on the planet, and uh, especially in the more recent time periods. So like less than a million years ago or two million years ago. Uh, they have like in- an incredible variety of fossils, giant sloth. Hmm. Uh, they have a bison. I believe they have a bison skull with a Clovis spear point, <laughs> inside it, which is just so metal and also like incredible to get that interaction. And they also have like so many shark megalodon shark teeth. It's ridiculous. They have a- an exhibit where it's like um, at least a couple megalodon, full megalodon sets with real teeth. And then they have all the relatives of the Megalodon and the giant Makos. And then on the floor, they just casually have all these Megalodons. Wow. Just, it's ridiculous. That's crazy. Yeah, it, it's sort of like, uh, yeah, it, it's like in The Hobbit with like smog and all the coins. <laughs> but except for that, it's like, instead of that, it's the, the Megalodon teeth. It's absolutely incredible. <laughs> um, and it, it, it frustrates me. It's like, it's so hard to find a Megalodon tooth, at least for me and like, Oh, same bodies. here. But yeah. for them, it's like they just, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I've I've never I've yeah. actually it's a certain type of wealth. <laughs> I've never. Uh, oh, uh, Howard uh, asked a question. Where is the museum? Where is the Florida Museum of Natural History? Yeah, that's a great question. And, well, it's in Gainesville, which which feels like Southern Georgia, but it's actually somehow in Florida. Mm-hmm. And um, that's that's like in the main campus of University of Florida is. Uh, where the Florida Museum is located. Gotcha. So, well, uh, Roy, 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 ha- huh? Roy Roy has made a comment. I'm afraid of butterfly gardens. Uh, I, I I agree. It is terrible. Also, <laughs> SpongeBob. SpongeBob. Did, have you ever seen the, the SpongeBob episode where they have like? Oh, and it, like, Royal Roy has mentioned he he and Howard are going to steal those teeth. That's going to be. That's like uh, was it National Treasure? Like like like. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. going to steal the megalodon. That's funny. <laughs> so. Um, I don't know if you can see, I think, I think how we set this up, you might not be able to see my camera, but, um, I have a copy of, no. okay. Yeah. So sorry. Well, imagine a beautiful giant blue book called sharks of the world. Uh, this copy came from the American museum of natural history, uh, in New York. Uh, and it's, it's like, I feel it, it's been, I've read from it pretty much on every stream. Um, it's a great compendium of all species. So um so yeah i just wanted to plug the american museum of natural history because wow. it's it's awesome but uh question slash statement on florida because it's interesting uh you mentioned gainesville being like southern georgia 
like florida F- florida uh, like florida is a fascinating state and, and, and like and that's an understatement it's a fascinating state ecologically like an amazing state ecologically i think north of orlando is basically like southern temperate environment and then south of orlando is like tropical um environment or tropical atlantic environment and even culturally it's really fascinating where like uh maybe northern florida feels more english and and like kind of like a different group and then like like as far as like um native american culture and then like southern florida is definitely spanish and more like caribbean culture like like am i am i like i because like that's kind of my read on it thought uh like addendums to that or thoughts on that as a floridian or yeah yeah very broadly that's the case um Although I'd, I'd mentioned that like the Gulf side of Florida is very much more, you know, retired communities and it's, it's very concentrated. Like the, the multicultural community is very concentrated sort of in the Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm beach part of Florida. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you're right on point. Otherwise when you're North of Orlando, it definitely feels like it just, it definitely feels like Georgia, even though, I think the the climate would be considered subtropical and you actually have mangroves growing all the way up into uh jackson mm. um so and on the gulf coast it grows like everywhere mm. but uh, mm. <laughs> yeah um although I, I would say that even those parts of florida are super unique like you get the springs the highest density of freshwater springs i believe in the world uh it's certainly in the country because there are like dozens and dozens of these crystal clear springs pouring out of the ground <laughs> and that that environment is so fascinating and unique and that is that's the one thing i do miss about living on the edge of south florida is that i'm so far away from the springs and uh like the springs are their own unique environment and i feel like you know it helped keep me like sane you <laughs> know when i was in the middle of florida in gainesville you know, which is an amazing community, but as a marine scientist, it was somewhat difficult to be basically in the, the part of Florida that's as far away as possible from the ocean. Mm-hmm. So I think it was like an hour and a half or two hours from the nearest water. Oh, body. wow. So it was the Florida Springs that helped keep me together emotionally, <laughs> <laughs> spiritually, even. So yeah. I got you. Did you ever see, like, I'm sure you've seen alligators in the springs, right? Probably. Yeah. Uh, not as much in the springs. I did see one next to the springs, but they don't like the cold water that mm. much, even though they definitely are in the springs, especially ones that have less uh, people in them. Uh, so like Silver River is a spring fed river, but there are many alligators mm. in it. Um, it's usually in, in the rivers that aren't significantly spring fed. Um, so for example, uh, let me think. There's the Peace River. The Peace River has a few gators, but the Peace River is so busy with people that it's not super popular. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm trying to remember what was the river. Mm-hmm. Well, Bunny and I are hoping to go to this river, actually. Um, well, while you're uh, searching that, um, Howard asked a question about Sharks of the World. Um, so it's actually uh, about who wrote that. Um, so Sharks of the World is by David A. Ebert, Mark Dando, and Sarah Fowler. I'll write that in the chat too. But it is um, more or less a derivative of Compagno. Um, so, so Howard, you're right that um, it's related to Compagno. Um, I think it's Leonardo Compagno or Leonard Compagno. I, I forget his first name and I apologize. But um, he actually is probably the um what's the word like like he he spearheaded or maybe not spearheaded but he was a leading figure in creating the first sharks of the world uh which was in the 80s i think 1984 it was when that was published and then uh, as kind of like that was more of like a research guide that wasn't really publicly available as far as i understand and then there was the famous um like the first edition of sharks of the world which i think was published mid-2000s and i believe he was like one of the lead authors on that and then this newest edition um, is it, his name is not on it, but it, it is a derivative of his work. So let me let me write out the uh, Sharks of the World. I'm just going to put this in the chat by David A. Ebert. Ebert's very famous shark scientist, Mark Dando and Sarah Fowler. Uh, there we go. So that will be in the chat. 
So I highly recommend it. It's an amazing read. Um, but sorry about that, Connor. I was just I just wanted to answer that question. So. No, 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 no. I'm a big fan of books. So. <laughs> but by the way, I've never. Um, when I used to live, I used to live in Bradenton, Florida, which was uh, near Tampa, and in that, I, I guess somewhere in Manatee County, I saw an alligator that was as big as a car, at least. Like, like, and I, I've never had an, a moment like that where it's like this animal's too big to be real. Like, 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 I've never, I've never had that moment in my life where it's like this is an enormous, terrifying animal, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I was I was looking at like a couple little alligators and then that one came out. I was like, nope, nope, this is really dangerous. I gotta I gotta leave. So <laughs> yeah. But well, at least you got to see a spinner shark before you left. Yes. When we hit up that uh, the power plant, that that still blows my mind. I've never seen anything like that in my life. That was wild. Yeah. Um. So you and I went to um. I think it's Tico is the Tampa Electric Company. Um, which is a very interesting place uh, because it is a power plant, but the water near the power plant is unnaturally heated. Um, and I don't know exactly why that is in terms of like how the plant does that. But because it's unnaturally heated, it's become in a, a place that's been very attractive to manatees mostly, but also sharks. And so there is an environmental, I don't know what to describe, I don't know how to describe it, but there is like a manatee, station or like a viewing station where you can actually go to at tico and you know they talk about manatee conservation um and they have like observation platforms and you and i and actually beautiful walking trails too but you and i connor we went to one of those platforms and we saw sharks leaping out of the water like like, like um i think the theory is that they're just like so ex they, they're either so excited by that temperature or that energy or they're trying to like clear parasites. I, I, I probably the truth is somewhere in the middle. I'm not really sure, but that was wild. That was a pretty cool day. So. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I like didn't I couldn't believe you because I've never seen that before. So I was like, oh, it's a dolphin or it's a tarpon because tarpon like to jump out of the water. And then I saw it. And I was, it was like this like, I want to say it was it wasn't super big. It was like probably like four feet mm -hmm. long, but it was like a torpedo. And it just like popped out of the water and then popped back in. It was just like, bada bing, bada boom. And then I never saw it again. But that's that's all the proof I need. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was incredible. And I'd never seen that at any of the other uh, power plants um, that provide that, that kind of coolant water. Uh, so in West Palm Beach, they also have like a manatee lagoon. And uh, unfortunately, they don't really have a lot of other organisms that really take advantage of that that are easy to see mm -hmm. although they do have a ton of manatees that show up uh that the people really love so mm -hmm. yeah man yeah. it's one of the one of the few benefits of i guess the the fossil fuels so yeah uh roy made a comment if it's a spinner shark uh, it might be it totally might be we were we were yeah, yeah. We, we were too far away to positively id it um, it could all, it could have been a small bull shark because I know they do come into that area quite often. Um, it's it was definitely some kind of carcharinid, um, when they're both part of the same family. But it was too far away. Well, uh, you know what? You know what? Kind of, that spinner shark's looking pretty chonky. I don't I don't know. Maybe it was a spinner shark. <laughs> He's, maybe. maybe. Yeah. 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 How how far away do you think it was when we saw it? Like. Like. I well. I mean, it, it was it was hard. I I couldn't I couldn't tell you what kind of shark it was, but I mean, it did have that color. It's the color that I remember. It was like bullet. Brown. Yeah. Do you know what's interesting? Yeah, like if these are yeah, that's Carcharinus brevipinna. So that's a spinner shark. Yeah, if if that is like yeah, since that is that speed, it, I mean, yeah, it totally could have been a spinner shark because uh, I'm I'm remembering it now as well, and just like i i always think spinner sharks are thin but that that is a that is a pudge so i, re I remember the shark we saw was pudgy so <laughs> it, 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 it totally could have been him yeah that is so cool yeah man um i i just thought of something and i totally forgot about that <laughs> um like with nurse sharks i've never seen one in the wild but now, now I remember, there we go. So I never saw one in the wild, but uh, Moat Marine Lab, 
um, in I think they're in Sarasota, um, but a uh, very famous shark research in, uh, place, and they have a pretty amazing aquarium uh, as far as the sharks are concerned. Well, actually, no, this is a pretty amazing aquarium overall, but the shark exhibit is amazing, um, and they have enormous sandbar sharks and enormous nurse sharks, um, and like it's kind of it's kind of wild like I, I think when you see nurse sharks on film you, you kind of don't assume it's a big animal but like when you really are with them like that's a that's a pretty chonky like like that's a big that's a big shark like nurse sharks i think could be 14 feet let me look that up um oh yeah yeah look at that sandbar that guy is huge that's, yeah. a, bit, that's a good looking sandbar too so, so. Good color. Some Preble Jack, the tarpon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you ever uh, have you caught tarpon when you when you go fishing? By the way, or oh, I wish I, I haven't had. Well, I haven't been fishing in a while, uh, and the only fish I've caught recently has been whiting. So one of the issues with the Indian River Lagoon and losing our seagrasses is a lot of our sport fish have also you know either left or you know declined. Mm -hmm as a result of, um, you know, the loss of that important habitat. So um, I haven't been very incentivized to go in the Indian River Lagoon fishing, and the ocean isn't that amazing either. Uh, we've had a pretty spotty pompano season, which is kind of one of our smaller panfish that we'd like to, to catch and eat. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the whiting has been pretty sparse too. And I, I think I've only... I actually saw a guy catch a nurse shark, and I helped release it back into the wild on the beach. Wow. But other than that, I've seen like a guy catch a snook, and that was it. Yeah, it wasn't a very big. It was like a three foot long nurse shark, but it was the guy was like concerned that it would bite, so I like kind of just jumped into action, like no gloves or anything, and I just like went over, like released it, and then kind of manhandled it into the water. Wow. Um, so. Yeah, that was nice. It was. It's nice to like help an animal in distress. Mm -hmm. I know that may seem hypocritical because I fish too, but you know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, you're targeting a certain species, and when you know another species gets caught, like there's this immediate sense of guilt, and you're almost like rescuing the fish from itself or from from myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah. in terms of handling the, also I. Uh, this is awesome. What you have on the screen is this moat, uh, like like a moat. Uh... Yeah, yeah. This is the shark habitat at moat. So it's mostly. Oh, this is apparently a, a big gag grouper and uh, sport fish, but the shark occasionally floats by the screen. Nice. So. Um, when you were handling the nurse shark, like uh, what what technique did you use? Like in terms of like how did you uh, kind of negotiate? Uh, like how big was that shark, and how did you negotiate yourself? Like in terms of like where you held it and how you got it over and everything like oh it wasn't that bad it was just like you know it was on the beach already so i just it was able like i got it unhooked and then i i, I think i grabbed it behind like the uh pectoral fence mm. kind of lift kind of <laughs> lifted it up awkwardly and just kind of like let the the water sort of support most of its weight and then kind of shut it nice off. Um, it's like a very strong animal, but, um, yeah. Yeah, like... Uh, Thankfully, it wasn't, uh, like, really fighting, like, trying hard to fight me, you know, putting it in the water. It would have been a lot different if it was, like, a lemon shark, because... Oh, yeah! You, know, you can lose, very easily lose a finger, you know? Yeah. And there, there's a video, actually, of a guy who lost a finger to a small shark, because he was unhooking it, it bit his finger, and then twisted it around basically like pulled it right off yeah so, oh my gosh like yeah. i know um a lot of like media um like popularly say shark's teeth are like razor blades but that that's absolutely true like it, it like like it is unbelievable yeah. how sharp those teeth are like 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 it's it, no joke so um but yeah man and we we talked about a couple times on the stream um just how sharks um like their body plan or like their muscular, I mean like the, the, those animals are like almost pure muscle. Um, so it's like, even if it's, you know, if you meet a shark the same size as you, um, it is, it is absolutely going to be so much stronger than, you know, a human of the same, like pound for pound. It is so much more, it is a much power, more powerful animal 
I can't speak. It's Monday. <laughs> it's 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 such a more uh, much more powerful well, <laughs> much more powerful animal pound for pound uh, because it is just like all, almost the entirety of its body mass is 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 just like muscle. Like like there's so much mu- muscle in, in those animals. So uh, this is really relaxing. Uh, this 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 screen. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, another one I highly recommend. Um, let me see. Is the Deerfield Beach underwater camp oh let's check that out um and that's a, yeah is that that's a live stream that i've watched just to like relax mm-hmm. uh, let's see of course it's going to be dark right now but yeah. if i go back a few hours oh hell yeah this is cool uh rory made a comment car granted sharks are just built with such amazing teeth amen to that like absolutely like so so cool like like the tooth type car granids are like um like the two types, the tooth types um, are are really exciting. Like like exciting in terms of their diversity. Like a lot of other sharks have like uh like kind of like a uniform tooth type. Um, but like carcharinid teeth are you know specialized in the sense that like you know they have like these more triangular teeth in the front, and then they you know kind of like curve backwards as you go backward into the mouth, and the bottom teeth are more like spiky. Um, so it's it's a pretty uh, unique. Um, mix of tooth types in a corcorinid's mouth versus um something like a dogfish uh, has like kind of like a single uh row of uh teeth um that's that's not much differentiation but this is cool uh this this deerfield beach cam this is really cool yeah let me just uh i'm gonna pull up the highlight reel that's probably the, the most exciting oh my gosh this is um, this is perfect oh this is this well, that's or something. That was an octopus. Yeah. yeah, that's a cobia. Some barracuda. Dude, this is awesome. Ah, oh, they really need to clean their screen. Woo! Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, this is just out in the wild. <laughs> Dude, I love this. This is so cool. Uh, trunkfish, right? Cowfish, trunkfish. Uh, cow. I think it's cowfish. That's a scrawled file fish mm-hmm. with some creveled. Uh, some jacks in the background nice uh these guys uh, oh this is hard to tell oh whoa there was, there was something oh what is that that little spotty guy Ooh, queen angel fish i'm not sure there's so many different species that's a porcupine fish uh getting followed by a jack oh my gosh getting, i think it's getting like scratches oh this is great that's, that's a parrot fish yeah that's a trunk fish. Uh, this is why I love South Florida because it's like you know I'm I'm a couple hours away from this, but theoretically those are tarpon. Uh, mm-hmm. I could like just drive out there, you know, on a weekend. I I'm not gonna. The conditions have not been great. Yeah, well, actually, it's funny. Like, I mean, I'm I'm in the Chesapeake Bay, and this is like amazing to me. So, like, like as far yeah, yeah. this is like a, a blurry Florida is is a best Chesapeake. So. Um, and it is, it is really beautiful to see all, all of this. Cause it's like, um, we have up here, you know, like, like kind of like cousins of these fish that are kind of more subtle, like, like tau togs or cousins of parrot fish, you know, but it's really cool. Like when you move South and you look at Florida, like how the biodiversity and like the colors explode, there's a nurse shark. Is that a nurse shark? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I didn't want to interrupt. Oh no, you're good. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's whatever. Yeah, we we're, we're, we gotta. You, Connor, you and I. Tarfish. Oh damn, miss that. Yeah, Connor. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me go back. It's hard to see. Yeah, you oh. you and I in the chat. We're on an ocean expedition right now. We're we're exploring South Florida. So this is this is cool. Ooh, great trigger fish. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that's a. This is, I like like dude. We're just we're spitting names, man. Like that. There's so many species here. <laughs> Oh, that's a manatee. Where? Wait, whoa. I wasn't expecting that. Oh, man. <laughs> Look at him. Yeah. Oh, this is awesome. That visibility is incredible. That's, that's what it's like in the summer, but it's like now uh, currently and in the wintertime, there's a lot more waves. So it's usually the conditions are like that. <laughs> it's like very cloudy. You know, you can't really see like 10 feet in front of you. You know, something can come out of the murk. Mm-hmm. I, I almost like freaked myself out because I was like about eight feet deep 
and I saw a big dark shape coming towards me, and it was a manatee. Oh. I thought my life was going to be over. I thought it was a giant bull shark. Nice. Um, Which, you know, my life wouldn't be over necessarily, but, you know, <laughs> it still makes you think. Uh, a couple comments. Uh, Roy Roy mentioned great hammerheads, lemons, and nurse sharks uh, pass by Deerfield Beach. It's awesome. Um, and then also uh, Samuel Griffin's joining the stream. What's up, Samuel? Uh, and thank you. He said the name is cool. So uh, the Dr. Jaws name is cool. So uh, welcome to our live stream. These are our shark study parties. So I got my uh, friend Connor, Dr. Connor McDonald here, and we're talking. We're talking about nurse sharks. We're also just talking about Florida in general, um, which is which is cool. Like just in, like the, like because these are not. What I love about this format is like they're not really lectures or like interviews really they're more like you, you and i are just chilling out and just talk you know talking about science wherever it leads so it's cool <laughs> but man I, I think this is one of the best like ways to disseminate information and just to you know engage with people because it's a it's an informal environment and you don't have to like watch someone talk at you for 40 minutes straight or you know 10 minutes straight even it's just it's just sort of a, a flowing conversation where people can contribute and it's sort of like everyone works together to build you know the conversation and generate insights instead of it just being this like super structured or organized you know format yeah for, so. thank you for, for sure so um yeah. you know um so, like, when you, um, if you don't mind me asking for, like, science communication, um, like, what, what are some, like, when you have to, like, uh, pre present, I mean, I guess not so much, like, presenting in academia, but presenting in the public, what are some um, challenges that, that you or, or, or peers kind of face in that, um, if you don't mind me asking, or we, we could switch subjects and stuff, but. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the biggest one is uh, imposter syndrome, you know, a lot of, <laughs> sort of in my opinion you know if you don't have imposter syndrome you know either you're doing something really right or something really wrong you know <laughs> uh, and i think it's very prevalent in the field to have this feeling that like you know it doesn't matter how many degrees you have when you're in front of like dozens or even like a couple weeks ago i was in front of 300 people Whoa. um giving uh, a talk that i had to give in three minutes <laughs> So it was like an elevator pitch speech that I had to give the 300 people. And uh, I couldn't help but be distracted by the size of the crowd. But um, so I think that that's, that's an issue that, you know, a lot of people don't think about because, you know, when you practice a talk, you know, a few times or, you know, you know your topic so well, it, it may sound like you're completely calm. But, you know, there's, there can be a lot of anxiety kind of bubbling underneath. But I think, you know, otherwise, you know, it's, it's it can be tough to translate you know it's a traditional issue in academia you know translating the the information from our peer-reviewed studies into uh kind of digestible uh concrete you know answers to people's questions um so like discoveries and insights you know that's one thing but like like telling someone like this is for sure what's happening in this environment or this is like there are so many conditional uh, words that we have to use because, you know, that's the nature of experience and the experiments and that's the nature of science as well. Um, so I don't know. It's, 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 it's also translating from the ivory tower of academia, uh, which, you know, it's, there are reasons why it can be difficult for academics to talk to the, the wider community. Uh, I think that there's, there's a traditional, sense of um not wanting to well it, not getting political is certainly something that a lot of scientists want to engage in and i, I think that's a laudable approach in, in many respects um so i think it's it's a combination of a lot of things that can make science communication more difficult mm -hmm. but i think that we've made so many strides even in the last 10 years in terms of uh bringing science to um like to the community and not just talking amongst ourselves with other mm -hmm. scientists that's something that i'm working on i'm working on a, a documentary about seagrasses um which brings in both people who live basically uh on seagrass beds the fishermen who depend on the seagrasses because the fish species depend on the seagrasses as well as the seagrass scientists who 
you know, dedicate their lives to researching this ecosystem and trying to breathe new life um, into many of the damaged ecosystems in mm. Florida. And, you know, I think another thing that's really, you know, I, like, I really applaud the work that you do oh. <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, inviting me or, or, or talking about, you know, disseminating the science of sharks to people, because I think it's, you know, even though, you know, you have your Ocean Ramsey and you have like shark water and you have do some documentaries, I think it's it's extremely important to understand the the true nature of sharks. And, you know, a lot of what you do brings people closer to a greater understanding about, you know, this this organism that lives that's lived on our planet for hundreds of millions of years but we still are trying to understand thank so, you man oh my gosh that was long-winded no you're good <laughs> thank you for joining me. no you're show. good i i really i sincerely deeply appreciate that thank you so much for for saying that and also um the chat really appreciates uh what you do i uh, got some great comments uh rory says heck yeah to to your you doc there? oh oh shoot can you hear me oh no oh this is a pivotal Hello. I think I think we'll save it. This is a pivotal moment. Um, pivotal moment. I have to I have to share. I can still see your screen. Can you hear me, Connor? No, it is cutting out. No worries. Oh man, I am gonna. What I'll do, guys, is I'm gonna probably quickly load that. Um, I think that was Deerfield Beach live cam. Um, and then also just text Connor on Facebook, just making sure that we're cool and we're okay. Um, and I definitely, I, I, uh, Roy, Roy, I see your awesome comment. Uh, Connor's seagrass documentary is going to be great. Like, um, he recently he shared with me that he got a grant for, uh, yeah, no worries. I can't. Shoot, yeah, I think I think Connor can't hear me now, but um, yeah, Connor Connor got a uh, a really um, awesome opportunity to create this seagrass documentary. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. Shoot. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm just gonna message him really quick. Oh my gosh, and my camera is Deerfield Beach live cam um, but yeah anyway um, here we go let's slap this on the screen and I'm messaging Connor privately. If, uh, while, while, while we're kind of like working on this, um, if anybody has any questions, um, like in terms of just like seagrass ecology or, oh, that's not it. Sorry, that's not it. Yeah. Live underwater camera. Currently watching. Just turning great on minds think, great minds water. think. For some. Great minds think alike. Reels, hopefully, <laughs> there'll be a shark somewhere in here. So, we'll both All right. be watching this. Dude, Connor's my hero. Like, like, hold on. I'm so I'm gonna message him, guys, uh, while we have these awesome fish in the background. Sorry about that. All right. Mm -hmm. Um. Ah, okay. Yeah, but so apparently, but I'm you're good. I know. So, I am going to continue to talk about South Florida and how amazing it is. <laughs> um, let's see. So, I can't see the comments that are being posted. So, uh, when Zach can uh, kind of get things sorted out with the audio, um, we'll we'll get figured out. But um some of my favorite places to go in south florida that i can't recommend enough if you have any opportunity to go to south florida um highly recommend um blue heron bridge it's one of the easiest places and one of the most amazing places to go in terms of uh water clarity so you go at high tide um there's a lot of biodiversity so you can see like the tarfish um on 
lots of things you'll see uh, different species of spade fish, angel fish, like that blue tang over there. Uh, they really enjoy the, uh, the habitat um, created by the bridge. Uh, <clears throat> there have even been reports of uh, different species of sharks. So I believe there's a hammerhead shark that's been sighted there in the past. Um, I've seen uh, eagle rays as well, which I believe are an endangered species. So also a very interesting organism and just absolutely gorgeous. Um, unfortunately, you don't get to see the amazing schools of tarpon like you can see there. But that is something you can see at Von Menzel State Park, um, which is in Deerfield Beach, actually, funny enough. Uh, at that beach, I don't think I've ever seen, ever had a day where I haven't seen a school of tarpon um, hmm. or uh, a sea turtle. Um, I don't think I've seen a lot of nurse sharks there. That's more of a thing for the Keys. Or if you go by any artificial reefs, you usually will see uh, nurse sharks. Uh, I've only seen a single species of shark other than that underwater. Um, so me and sort of the same environment. Uh, and that would be a reef shark. And that was off of... <laughs> oh, that's a spade fish right there. Um, that was off of Florida Keys. So that was in Key Largo. Uh, I believe off of uh, Penny Camp. Uh uh, which is a state park. And um, they have a, a snorkel charter where you can like see uh, Christ in the Abyss, which is an amazing statue. I highly recommend checking it out. It's only in like 15 feet of water. But sure enough, yeah, there was like a five-foot reef shark there. It's not a super common sight to see, but it's something that uh, I was lucky enough to run into when I was doing my swim around. <laughs> so, And I have GoPro footage, so... <laughs> that's the classic video or it didn't happen is uh, uh, for better or for worse. My, um, let's see. Why am I saying? Hold on. I, can you hear me now? Okay. Let's see. Well, hopefully, yeah, hopefully it might be clear a bandwidth well. thing, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to think what else. If you go to Casperson beach, speaking of fossils, I highly recommend Casperson beach, which is in Venice, Florida. And that's on the Gulf Coast. And uh, you can see uh, tons of fish on a good, on a clear viz day, uh, as in uh, a water ability. Um, and then the fossil hunting there is just utterly amazing. Like, you can find them off the beach, some small shark's teeth. But if you go into the riprap that's just offshore, you can find some big teeth. I found, in one day, I found a partial meg and a... a like a small complete egg. Oh, okay. Zach asks me, what are the effects of seagrass decline on the bonnet head? And um, I think the answer is generally that the bonnet head would suffer a population decline as a result of the loss of seagrass. Um, partially from the loss of a technical food source but mostly because, uh, well, to back up a little bit, um, bonnethead sharks uh, in a couple studies have been found to uh, eat seagrass. Ooh, yeah. Uh, oh, that looks like a lemon shark. Oh, and another one. <laughs> ah, I love Florida. Anyway, um, so, uh, so bonnethead sharks could lose a food source in that sense, but what's worse is that they're losing uh, nursery grounds and they're losing... Um, what I believe is their most significant food source, which is small fish and invertebrates, which are oftentimes dependent on seagrass. Nurse shark. Or in other yep. words, oh, that's a nurse shark right there. Um, in other words, the uh, seagrass beds produce so many invertebrates and fish, um, I believe in one acre it, you can get like 10,000 fish it's either no one hectare which is the size of a football field you can have uh, at least 10,000 fish and um, tens of millions of invertebrates so those invertebrates and those fish will help feed the bonnet head and uh, you know help them grow in their environment and without that environment the bonnet head populations would decline so I guess it's a long it's a long way of saying that yes the the bonnethead shark uh, has declined in association with the loss of habitat. 
Uh, and we've seen that with a lot of other organisms as well, uh, including the manatee. There have been thousands of manatees that have died as a result of uh, seagrass decline. In the also, thank you, Howard, for these questions. I uh, just want to shout out, uh, these are Howard Care questions, and these are awesome. Ah, where are good Miocene marine deposits in South Florida? Oof. Well, it depends what your definition of South is. So uh, with the Niaka River being also a good place to potentially find uh, fossils, uh, Casperson Beach is another good uh, place to go because it's, it's a beach, so you're at the ocean already, which is amazing. And then you get to find fossils. Um, so uh, Peace River is a nice place if you want like a nice day and you want it to be relatively quiet. You can't guarantee anything with the airboats, um, which frequent the river. But um, yeah, I'd say those are probably the best spots. Um, I can't think of anything like south of that. Because um, once you get into like Lauderdale and or like Naples, uh, Fort Myers, you know, the, the, it, it starts, the pickings get slim. Um, I believe that's based off of like the geologic deposits. If you're doing scuba diving, your best bet's probably going to be Venice Beach because um, you can find a bunch of uh, shark's teeth and uh, marine mammal fossils in like 30 feet of water. It's like not even like that much. So uh, the water visibility is not super great, but um, that's definitely a place that I'd recommend. I've done it once before, um, and uh, a guy who was in our group uh, found a megalodon tooth, and that was just one dive. So out of five people, one guy found a nice megalodon tooth. And, you know, we found other stuff too. Like um, it was either myself or, or a friend of mine who gave it to me uh, found a whale ear bone, of all things. It was big. It was almost the size of my fist. Hmm. So... Um, yeah, you never know what you can find down there. So that's, it's, it's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm sending, Let's pause. um, I'm sending Connor uh, a couple messages. I'm sending these questions. So I'm trying to see if we can get the audio back online. Pause. <laughs> so, um, but let's see. I don't think he can hear me right now. And, um, I have a couple follow-up questions of myself, so I'll just text them to him, uh, while, we're figuring out what's going on here. Um, so Connor, I doubt you can hear me right now, probably, right? Um, I'll just like spend five seconds on this. And if you can't hear me, like um, shout out if you can, you probably can't, you probably can't. So I'm not really sure what's going on because uh, the Teams was working. Or you want me to speak Zach, just let me know. Oh, <laughs> he can't hear me. Okay, so we'll, we'll probably keep doing what we're doing. Um, I'll just text some questions and um, the one question I have is best places to study sharks uh, in Florida. Um, and then I'm going to ask undergrad uh, sharks in Florida. Undergrad and grad. Because the answers can be different, um, like, like in terms of like the research. So, Ah, best place to study sharks in Florida, undergrad and grad. Ooh. Good question. Um, I think University of Miami has a has a, an established shark program. Let me look it up. Uh, I think the I think the professor's name is Hammer Hammerstrom. Uh, Hammerschlag. That's the one I hear the most of. Yeah, I'll I'll uh, Hammerschlag. He's pretty he's pretty uh, famous. Or I'll just do... Ah, uh, Hammer... Thank yeah. you. <laughs> hammer... Slog. There we go. Ah, I got it confused with a, a scholarship. Name. Yeah. No, you're good. Um, let's see. I'll just, I'll just Google it. Florida... Because I'm sure University of Florida is something. They have basically everything. Um, but... Florida... Sure. What's fun? What's fun is like Connor and I are rocking this bizarre communication, like ah, well, they're funny enough. The Florida Museum uh, has a Florida program for shark research, directed by Dr. Gavin Naylor, mm. and staffed by a team of research scientists. Naylor's famous. Naylor's a big name. Yeah. So 
So they have an amazing program. I know that uh, a colleague of mine, a friend, a good friend of mine, uh, Nicole, worked on uh, shark research at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University, and they are opening, or they have opened, a uh, water school, which is focused on marine science. Um, let's see. So I, I would say, I would say, like, and this is bias. Uh, University of Florida would be a great place to do an undergrad because it provides a lot of different opportunities to study different fields in marine science. Now, a lot of the marine scientists are kind of scattered around different departments. Uh, so fisheries, I was in soil and water sciences. Um, even some folks in engineering, they work with different materials that are from marine science. Um, but then in terms of graduate schools, then maybe that's where University of Miami or FGCU might be better options as well. So, um, let's see. I got you, Roy. Here we go. <laughs> uh, do you think nurse sharks look like catfish? Hmm. Uh, uh, not really. <laughs> I mean, I, as a fisherman, I'm sort of biased. As a saltwater fisherman, I'm very biased. I don't like catfish because they they're sort of the traditional bait stealers and uh unlike freshwater catfish saltwater cats are actually venomous so you can get poked by a spine and have to take a trip to the hospital it won't kill you it might make you wish you were dead <laughs> um but yeah i'm not a big fan of those and i've caught way more than i care to admit so um i think that's that's kind of my answer. I'm biased. I don't think that the nurse sharks. Oh, that's that's amazing. I'm gonna go back to that. <laughs> so this is some really fascinating shark behavior. I, I've seen it once or twice where they're like they flip over and they scratch themselves to like probably to get rid of parasites. But it could be something as simple as just having an itch. Um, but yeah, that's that's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. I, I personally don't think they look like catfish, but. <laughs> That's just that's just me. Ugh, man. Uh, I'm gonna ask him if he can click the mute button. The barracuda or something else too. Um, sometimes I think I ponder whether or not I should be more concerned about the barracuda than any possible shark that's like hiding behind me or something. Let's see. <laughs> We're going to attempt another. Yeah, okay. we're going to attempt another audio test. I'm going to. Because I don't know. If, be muted for a moment. I don't know if that's going to change anything, but it might help. Um. And then let's see. Okay. Unmute. Because like uh on that on the um and like Connor Connor's been doing amazing, but like on the um uh. And now I'm unmuted. Okay. Or maybe you're unmuted. Try the one in the center. Ah, Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. the, the best. Well, I guess any virtual. Ah, try the one in the center. Thank you, Bill Gates. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, honestly, like this is this is as as wacky as this has been. This is actually going really smoothly uh, for the most part. I, I I like like I'm having a lot of fun with this actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. No. Oh. Yeah, uh, one more time. Seems I. <laughs> hmm. Um, I've I've ended up in the unenviable position of not being able to unmute you, you Zach. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's slightly awkward. No, it's okay. Um, uh, we'll go back to. Hmm. Let me think. Let's go back to live live cam. Let me go to people. Because I, I I can. Why can't I unmute? I don't know. Bill Gates designed this. That's very strange. He does this to he he toys with people. He does this as he he's the first troll. The the original of of. Don't let me. <laughs> um, I just let Connor know. Let's go back to live cam and then mm. um. Microsoft more like micro rough. Yes. Well. <laughs> Make an attendee. Uh, and then, how can, I still can't unmute. That's so strange. 
you're doing you're doing great it's it, it actually like honestly like connor connor's mm. been fantastic so oh this is, this is interesting there we go go back to live ah yeah yes. we'll do that on it can do this all day <laughs> Yeah, and Roy, I I'll uh, reach out to Connor. Go actually back to. The, I'll reach out to Connor later. Uh, let him know beach. your seagrass comments because I think he'd appreciate that. So, uh, a recent one. Mm-hmm. Ah, this will be a good one for you guys. Mm-hmm. There's a hammerhead shark somewhere in this foot. Done. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, man, I'm trying to think what else. What else could I talk about? Um, so I work in the Indian River Lagoon, and that's north of all this good stuff. Uh, the water visibility used to be absolutely incredible, uh, and that was thanks in great part to the seagrasses because they help lock in the nutrients and they help take the – the sediments that are in the water column and the nutrients and they can lock them away. Um, but unfortunately over the years, as water pollution has increased, um, we've had a few like really just absolutely insane bloom events, uh, as well as just a gradual beat down by pollution and boat propellers that's resulted in a loss of seagrasses. And, um, it's it's created an environment where it's like it can oftentimes be very murky very difficult to see but there are some incredible days where you get a high tide and you get some of the water from offshore and it's really something else like you're just swimming around in the lagoon and you get a taste of what people saw you know 20 or 30 years ago and uh, I, i i had the pleasure of interviewing some fishermen who um I've seen, used to like know what the Indian River Lagoon was like, and there was one person who even said that you could go lobstering in the Indian River Lagoon, which is just an insane concept uh, nowadays. Because the Indian River Lagoon is like practically lifeless <laughs> by comparison. Uh, there are still a lot of organisms that live in the Indian River Lagoon, but it's it's nothing like it used to be. And unfortunately, that's something that we're seeing a lot of in Florida or environments that you know people really are loving to death and uh it's really important to try to find ways to help control the effects of our increasing population on our environment and um you know while a lot of strides have been made in the last couple of years especially um there's still so much progress that needs to be made and we're still so far away from even attempting to reverse some of the impacts that have been made on the environment And, you know, outside of a few success stories like in Tampa or um, in Crystal River, you know, our environments are just rapidly degrading. Um, It's it's slightly depressing, I know, but like it's one of those things where it's it's it might be aggravating. It might be frustrating, but it's it's something to know about because, you know, for example, like in the Keys, we've lost, oh, geez, like over 90 percent of our corals. It's probably even more than. It's probably like 98%. Um, but uh, just a vast majority has been lost. And when you go to the Florida Keys, you know, the water visibility is like this. It's incredible. You see sea turtles, you fish, um, and you see like, you know, colorful stuff on the bottom. But what you don't see is that you're basically like gawking at the ruins of like a lost civilization, a lost ecosystem that 30 years ago had structural like coral reefs like staghorn coral elkhorn coral as far as the eye could see and there are images that like bring me to tears like like seeing an image taken in 1980 of coral reefs just into the distance and then today where it's like there's nothing left there are just a couple pieces of dead coral that used to be alive and you know it's the result of of water pollution it's a result of climate change um it's a result of so many people coming into florida and loving it to death and and the regulations not being there when we needed them to be um and that's something that you know a lot of people have been kind of raised awareness to in, in my area 
uh, we had a couple really massive algae blooms that really woke people up to the idea that, you know, our impacts, human impacts, have severe negative consequences to our environment. And, um, you know, it might be something that a lot of people in the audience can think of as something like extremely obvious, but, you know, to other people who are just living their lives, you know, and just want to get some you know, real estate on the water, that's something that they really don't think about or come face to face with until you get moments like that. Uh, moments like when the water is literally emerald green, like, like acrylic paint green, you know, not something that you're, you could imagine um, in an, in a healthy environment, you know, these nasty toxic microcystis blooms. Cystis? Yeah. Microcystin is the toxin. Um, oh, what kind of pollution do you find within your research expeditions? Um, well, it's a good question. I mean, when it comes to the loss of seagrasses in the, in the IRL, the Indian River Lagoon, it's uh, nitrogen and phosphorus are the biggest culprits. Um, so we see that expressed in the environment in the form of uh, like just this massive amount of algae growth. Um, which is a sign of a sick ecosystem. Oh, that's an amazing <laughs> thing in my head. Oh, and there's its pen. <laughs> that's great. That's um, awesome. Unmistakable. But, um, uh, as well as the algae blooms. Um, actually, let me pull up a picture. Well, actually, a video. Um... Let's see. It should be somewhere around here. Hey, Connor, I changed something on my end. You can't hear me now, can oh, you? Geez, you can see how disorganized my <laughs> stuff is. Let me go to my... I'm going to go to my... Email. He can't hear me. And... <laughs> let's see. Uh, let me... Uh, black out his email. Yeah. So this is something that I found doing field work uh, recently on Wednesday. It's a, uh, it's a manatee carcass, and the manatee was dropped off by uh, SWC, um, a Fish and Wildlife Commission. And um, basically, this, this manatee most likely starved to death from a loss of seagrass. And... Um, that's something that we do come face to face with as a result of the pollution that's occurred in the Indian river lagoon, where the, the algae outgrew the, the seagrass suffocated it. And then we're left with this environment where, you know, a lot of these organisms that depended on this extremely important environment, you know, they, they start to die off without that environment available. So uh, a little sobering and definitely not what I was expecting to get when I was going out into the field and, you know, poking around. Uh, we were, we have a restored seagrass community there um, that we were identifying. Um, but yeah, it's just a somber reminder of why we do the work that we do. So. Have sea mines had a negative impact on the marine environment? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, both, you know, to terrestrial environments, just sort of the direct impacts to riverine systems. Um, but yeah, absolutely to, um, uh, aquatic environments. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm not a hundred percent sure on this, but I believe the Piney Point disaster that occurred a couple years ago in Tampa was a direct result of, uh, a massive leakage of phosphate mine material. Um, so that was, you know, that, that's a direct example of the, the pollution that could occur from uh, the, the phosphate mines. And, uh, you know, of course, phosphate mines, they produce the fertilizers that people then liberally will throw around um, uh, in areas where there'll be runoff and then you know that will become pollution 
nowadays, though, you know, uh, governments and, and people are taking significant strides to help reduce the, the amount of fertilizers being put in the water. And there are, uh, in a lot of different communities, there are sort of these seasons where you can and cannot put fertilizer down. Um, so some progress is, is definitely being made, but we have a long way to go before we control our, our nutrient emissions. And with more and more people pouring in, that means that there are more nutrients that need to be properly managed. Last question. Okay. Last but not least. <laughs> How many shark species have you seen during your career? Which kinds? Um, okay. So, um, seen a lot of nurse sharks. Nurse sharks are amazing. Uh, I've seen some bonnet head sharks. Uh, I had the pleasure of doing work with, uh, volunteer work, that is, with the uh, Rookery Bay Center. Um, and they do a, a shark survey. And um, I've seen so many bonnethead sharks because we catch them. <laughs> Excuse me. So we had um, both, uh, I, I think we had long lines. We were permitted to have uh, long lines as well as uh, gill nets to catch the different species of sharks. And this, you know, it was with the intent to tag them. So it's not a, it's the, the way that we collected them was not um, inefficient or fatal um, as traditional gill netting is where I believe you just leave the gill net out for, you know, like a long period of time and the animals die and you catch them. But uh, in this case, uh, we were routinely monitoring the uh, long lines and the gill nets, and um, this technique's been used for a really long time in that area, and we found a lot of bonnethead sharks. That was the most common shark that we'd find. Um, uh, I, I might have forgotten to mention this, but this was uh, by the Everglades, so uh, it's South Florida environment. Um, and what's interesting about bonnetheads is that they actually have a form of melanism, so they get freckles, hmm. basically. Uh, so we'd <laughs> find these sharks that, uh, you know, they just randomly have these freckles on them. And it was really interesting. It makes me wonder if they keep the freckles through their life. But uh, we also uh, caught a, a bull shark that was, I think it was like four feet long. Um, and then finally, I have seen a reef shark. So that was uh, a really cool experience as well. Let's see. Okay. Well, it's it's really been a pleasure, and uh, I I really appreciate you guys like sticking <laughs> it out. Um, you know, I can't see you guys, but it's real. Oh, this is just getting into <laughs> stuff. Okay, um, but it's really been a pleasure meeting you uh, virtually, and uh, you know I look forward to the opportunity to talk to you guys again sometime. Um, and uh, you know, thank you for listening to me and. You know, it's it's always exciting talking to a community of people that are not only invested in, in marine science, but also invested in the past, you know, in in, in fossiling and, and finding shark's teeth and, and, you know, sort of learning about, you know, the earth that, you know, is kind of before people. I, I always find that really interesting and, and a window, sort of a, a teacher in terms of, you know, how incredible our environment can be, especially if we manage it properly. So with that, I will uh, wrap up uh, the conversation. But again, thank you so much. And uh, have a mm -hmm. good night. All right. So that was completely awesome. And uh, th thank you also, guys, just for kind of sticking out with us. Because like, I'm not really sure why the audio got so uh, screwy at the end. But like, Connor was an absolute champion in terms of sharing his knowledge and um, just just answering your questions. And actually, uh, I'm so sorry, Ryan. I just saw your last question, uh, strangest thing. So I um, uh, promise we'll to uh, follow up uh, with Connor. Um, and I'm sorry. Let me get over to... I use some red lists because I had the um, nurse shark here on this. So, but um, yeah, so so Connor was a really amazing and just like like it was really great being able to kind of hear of um, you know kind of his research and Florida. Um, so Roy, I will ask him um, his uh, your question about nurse sharks. Um, one thing that uh, I, I uh, it's kind of a shame, and I wish. Um, 
we were able to kind of do this live, but um, because Connor was awesome and like such a sport, uh, being able to share, um, you know, his world with us and being a guest on the Dr. Jaws Live, uh, I am going to send him, he does not know this yet because he's not here, but I'm going to send him a uh, Carcocles Anguistidens tooth um, as a thank you um, and as a, as a special uh, thank you for being here. So, um, but you guys are amazing and uh, I had a lot of fun talking about uh, the Nurse Shark and Florida and Connor's research uh, with Connor. And um, thank you so much for your questions because they were actually like they were all awesome questions and and it, it just like I I kind of like love them so like and we had, we had a good back and forth um, while he was like narrating so um, you guys are awesome but uh, next week uh, I think we're gonna wrap up for tonight but next week we are going to do the crocodile shark um, so that is I forget. Is that Pseudocarcarius camarari? Um, but it's an awesome distant cousin of the great white. Um, and it's a really rare shark as far as I know. So that is going to be our awesome shark for next week. But uh, we'll wrap it up for tonight. And then I'm going to follow up with Connor and uh, mail him his tooth. Uh, so, um, But thank you guys so much. I, I had a hell of a lot of fun uh, doing this with you guys and doing this with Connor. And I think we all had a really good time. Like exploring florida and uh seeing like i didn't know those like live cams exist so uh, or existed so that was a lot of fun but you guys are rock stars thank you so much for being a great audience and we will see you next week what well, week <laughs> i can't speak it's monday we will see you next week uh with the crocodile shark and we will definitely do more of these um uh interview podcast like things in the future there's a couple other people um who might be coming on uh soon so i will keep you posted on that so but thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope you have a great rest of your week. And you know, our community, you guys are just champions. So just thank you. Thank you for loving sharks. And thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next time. And I'm signing off. So have a good night, guys. <laughs>